my notebook chose today of all days to start uh, dying on me at uh, a strange intervals for no particular reason. I, I don't know how to fix it. It, it started happening when I was uh, playing the Russian Super Final in Chita, and then it went away uh, and chose today to, to come back uh, tomorrow. Uh, I have a busy social program in uh, in the midday and in the in the evening I fly to Moscow and then to Reykjavik uh, eventually. Uh, so I will have no chance at all to fix it. And uh, if this happens while I'm playing, I I apologize in advance. There's really not very much I can do about it. Um, well, with this uh, sort of introduction, um, we should probably start playing. And uh, I will try and keep an eye on chat. So if you have any questions or or requests, I will I will try and uh, uh, address those. There was already a question which I probably should start with before I start playing. Let's uh, spend another minute talking. Uh, this week saw. Uh, the announcement from FIDE that the uh, the candidates uh, in uh, 2016 will be held in Moscow, but uh, the uh, wildcard nomination went to Livon Aronian because the money for the candidates is being uh, provided by the Armenian company with the view of uh, getting Aronian into, into the candidates tournament. And uh, I have already been asked in chat what I think about this. Uh, well, what I think is, uh, you know, in regards to Moscow, uh, Moscow is, you know, a one hour flight away. It's very convenient for me in terms of logistics and everything. And uh, in that respect, it's fine. Uh, uh, playing uh, on Russian soil creates its own kind of dynamics. I'm not sure if it's better or worse for me to be playing in Russia in a tournament as important as this. But once again, I would have been fine with uh, more or less any outcome in terms of uh, venue. As for uh, Livon getting the wild card in Moscow, um, you know, Kramnik almost qualified by rating and is obviously a very strong candidate for any wild card for 2016. Uh, Grishuk was above 2800 for March of the previous season, and you know we have other very strong players who could have been uh, picked uh, and who are uh, at the very least, you know, eligible to be picked. So it's a bit strange, but there, uh, you, you know, Rajabov played in London, uh, so it's not as if this hasn't happened before. And uh, Livon, of course, is a fantastic player, and uh, his his inclusion makes the tournament uh, uh, even stronger. So I don't think you we you 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 can argue that you know uh, any any harm has been done uh, to the tournament by the inclusion of Livon. But but yes, uh, you know Russia has a lot of very very strong players, and uh, uh, the fact that it's in Moscow, but uh, Livon is uh, is getting the wild card is. Uh, is bound to be a discussion point, so to speak. But uh, mm, that's how it is. And uh, now we can at least start preparing properly now that we know the lineup. Anyway, uh, enough talking. Let's play some chess. A Jordanian player who hopefully will connect to the server in time because, you know, Starting with a with, a, with an aborted game would not be. I mean, it's nothing new, but uh, uh, yeah, I can't play one g4 when I'm black. I'm I can't even promise. Oh, okay, here we go. I thought about a a sort of a thematic show today, but uh, I don't know what will come out of it. I, you know, uh, uh, today I will probably not get very much sleep. At least I, I expect not to get very much sleep because. Uh, uh, the Hearthstone World Championship is about to start, I expect, in a couple of hours' time, which I'm uh, hoping to watch live. And, you know, in this spirit, I, I thought about making this stream, uh, you know, all about uh, going face, as we all know that the face is the place. And uh, I, I thought maybe I should try sort of uh, playing for mate in every single game. But the problem with this idea is that um, it requires, it requires uh, you know, a lot of cooperation, a lot of cooperation from, from your opponents. 
even if you play uh, a reasonably sharp sharp opening like uh, like the Sicilian, like I'm playing like right now, uh, you're not at all guaranteed to get a position where you can actually play for mate until until you count playing for mate when you've taken all of your opponent's pieces, which you know you could argue it counts, but uh, that's not really what is probably meant by going face. So I will try play, playing as sharp as possible today, but uh, whether this will uh, actually create a, a, a sharper stream overall is uh, unclear as of right now. I also made a kind of a resolution for myself to try and lose fewer games on time today, but once again, uh, there is absolutely no guarantee this will actually help happen. You know, one way of doing, uh, of uh, sort of uh, seriously aiming for that would be to more or less stop talking when I run uh, very low on time. But um, I think, uh, you know, that has its own drawbacks. I don't know if uh, people will like that. Me just, uh, you know, going all out, so uh, trying to win every single game uh, and, uh, you know, shutting up for long stretches. Uh, would be an idea, but I'm not sure if it improves the show or not. So far in this game, I'm just uh, picking up loads and loads of material and uh, uh, not, not much commentary really is required here because uh, my opponent made a very big mistake early, early in the game. And uh, yeah, Resign is, has been strong for a while. Uh, but uh, it doesn't seem like my opponent is in the mood for that. Sadly, I don't have any forced mate after queen g2. I, don't, I, I can't. Uh, knight g3 check followed by something would be nice, but it doesn't actually deliver mate, which is kind of sad. But I can exchange everything and play it. Whoops. Uh, and and just play a uh, you know a, a knight end game for me and a pawn end game for my opponent. That would probably be the, the 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 best way to go about it. And yes, to answer that question, Hearthstone really I I seem to be uh, uh, you know, still interested in the game, and even though I, I agree, I'm not sure if we should be discussing the current meta status, but meta status. But yeah, there there has been a bit too much randomness recently. But uh, I still quite like at least watching the game at a high level. I think is still very interesting. Trying to remember what I'm supposed to do uh, in this particular subline of the Dutch. I would like to play e6, but I suspect knight b5 might be a very strong reply. I think I should start with a6, because allowing knight b5 followed by c4 uh, lets white uh, solve more or less the only positional problem he has currently, which is that the knight on c3 is slightly misplaced, and uh, he will have to invest some time before he can start doing something with my very solid pawn center. Still, of course, White's position is very pleasant and, uh, you know, will be very, very hard to break down. Generally speaking, d4, 5, knight, c3, the, these types of uh, Dutch are uh, extremely solid for White and uh, give him a decent chance for a slight advantage. Maybe not a large advantage, but a slight advantage for sure. And they require a, a great deal of precision from black so as not to uh, end up in a very, very uh, difficult situation. Knight a4 may have been a decent idea on the previous move. I'm less certain about this. I'm not sure where, uh, where my opponent is going with this. If I manage to wrestle control of the e5 square away from him, I should be doing very, very well here. Hmm. I think I can win a piece here. 
And if I can win a piece, I should win a piece. This is what I meant by, you know, the importance of the e5 square and uh, White's play was, you know, very much, you know, in a cooperative in in his, you know, his previous three moves were a bit too abstract for the position. He should have uh, tried and sort of interacted with my plan slightly uh, heavier, so to speak. He did try to bring the knight from c3 to some better squares and potentially push c4 later on, but uh, unfortunately in that time I, I was able to uh, assume control of the e5 square and I will play e4 next move against, well, anything. And uh, that fork will actually pick up a full piece. I assume the stream is still live because, uh, you know, the, the, the way my machine is working these days, I can't really uh, know for certain if uh, my opponent is not replying because he's thinking or he's not replying because my machine died again. But uh, let me know in chat if you can still he see and hear me. Ah, okay. That solves that particular riddle. Well, one, one very large hint that it's live and why I wasn't so worried when I was saying all that is that when the machine dies, I can't move the mouse or click any buttons. Basically, it dies completely and utterly. Suddenly, basically, you can't do uh, anything at all on it. So uh, as long as I can shuffle my mouse around, I feel that we're still, we're still streaming. So... Um, yeah, I remember about the grove, but let's try and play some uh, sharp openings without, uh, you know, jeopardizing your position too much. This is uh, a, a line of the Nidoc, which has been very, very topical for a long time, and uh, which requires a great deal of thought and memory. I think I had a game starting from this position a very, very long time ago in which I went knight c5 against Kurt Hansen 20 years ago. I think I played knight c5 in this position. So I will just make this move, uh, you know, in, in honor of, uh, of that anniversary, <laughs> so to speak. It's a cute little idea. Basically, uh, if I manage to land the knight on a4, as I did just now, it's very, very difficult for black to actually challenge it. And it stops his uh, queenside play uh, quite efficiently. Although, maybe not against this particular plan. But maybe I can even do this. If and when he actually attacks the knight on a4, I can play b3. And uh, now that he has only one knight on the board, it's very, very difficult for him to actually even organize any kind of exchange. It will take him three moves. It will take him three moves to uh, even offer an exchange of this piece. He will have to play something like queen b7, followed by bishop d8, followed by knight b6. And in that time, uh, I can hope to create something on the king side, for instance. Uh, I don't know which one I should start with, maybe h5. I will just continue pushing these pawns because if I get h5 and g6, both of those moves in, he will have to start switching to the king side because uh, it will require his immediate attention. Okay. Yeah, and this I, this actually is quite decent, I think. I should have, I should have thought about that earlier. This has been well played by my opponent. I like this idea. And I should have probably included queen e2 at some point early in the game, because now it's too late. He will take on a4, I will take on a6, and he will give, him, give me mate in two by queen takes c2, queen takes b2. And if I play this, he will have uh, c4, c3 as a very strong plan to follow up. I have a feeling 
And also the, the, the rook on the sixth now, you will notice, it, it, it participates very actively in the defense of the king's side. This was a very nice plan by my opponent. I like it. I can probably still try and ignore all this. But it will be hard. But the move I just made has its own drawbacks, obviously, because opening up the B file will create, uh, you know, a great deal of counterplay as well. And C4 is a good move. Luckily for me, I don't actually have to respond to C3. I can. Uh, Play queen e4, follow it by rook c2 and rook hc1. And just ignore this pawn is there, more or less. Or at least try to. And then maybe try something on the king's side, because he still has no threat on the queen's side. Now I can play f4, maybe, and uh, create some issues for him in the center. Because as long as this rook is on c2, there is... Uh, uh, no real threat, at least no immediate threat on the queen side. I will stop complimenting my opponent while he will stop making good moves. I think uh, saying well played when people play well against you, especially on stream, is a pretty decent idea. I think, whoops, I don't know what happened there. And I don't know how to get rid of it now. Sorry. Uh, I think I can start with fe5. And now maybe I even have time for b3, although this is stretching it a little bit. I might get mated along the a-file now. This is now very, very risky for me, but I also have my own trumps on the king side, which I should start using, I guess. This is very slow. This will not be fast enough, I think. But I think bishop takes d6 was potentially a mis... Ah, okay. This was a very complicated game, which was spoiled by... Which was spoiled by... Uh, Uh, the fact that we were in a great deal of time trouble. And uh, Rook A quite probably was a mouse slip, but uh, if we look at this position, he probably planned to play Rook A2 check, but after King D3 has no more checks and Queen E8, uh, and Queen E8 still wins next move. So hang on a second. Just uh, type in a reply. <clears throat> oh, but a, a very interesting game, uh, a very interesting game up to that point. And uh, people have been wondering about knight c5 and why he didn't take. If he takes, I go d6. And he can probably try and hang on to that extra pawn by playing uh, something like, I don't know, knight fd7, d7, queen e7. But if you look at the amount of play my bishops get in this position, something like, I don't know, queen d5 first, <clears throat> rook a7, and maybe bishop c4, I get a, a fantastic play for, you know, the one pawn I had to give up for this. So I think Kurt Hansen, a very strong Danish grandmaster, replied by playing a4 against me, using the fact that I currently cannot take on b4, because he will take on c5 then with, with tempo and I can't win the piece back. I think I replied by playing g5, he went b3, and it became incredibly wild from here. And I think I eventually won. Well, I, I'm pretty sure I eventually won, but I don't remember what happened from this position onwards. It was a very interesting game. I think, uh, uh, keeping in touch with chat, I think I actually annotated it for new in chess in, in 96, because uh, this game was played in December of 95. Okay. What else do we have here? The problem with the grob is that my opponent might take it as disrespect, but okay, people have been demanding the grob, so let's
Uh, so let's play the grob. I don't think trying to refute the grope by playing d5 and taking on g4 is the way to go, although uh, this uh, this is also quite decent, of course. I mean, uh, g4 is not going to refute chess, you know, by, I mean, I can probably try and, yeah, I would take with the knight, though. I think taking with the pawn uh, lets me off the hook here. You should try and uh, develop as many pieces as early as possible against somebody who wasted two MP on spoiling his kingside tra structure. So uh, b takes c6 is uh, a mistake. I still quite like Black's position because I'm not sure where I'm supposed to castle here. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get mated immediately, but castling kingside is not a very uh, is not a very comfortable proposition. I think I will try and castle queenside actually. No, I think black should be slightly better after 1g4, although uh, probably not by much. Got, an, got a Skype confirmation from Jan that everything, everything seems to be running smoothly, which is good. Problem is, I, I really have no way of predicting when the machine could might freeze again. So uh, if that happens mid-game, that will effect effectively cancel that game, which is uh, really, really unfortunate and not something I'm looking forward to. Okay, I completed part one of the plan. I castled Queenstide. If he now goes a5, a4, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, though. <laughs> Knight d5 is also a very decent move. Although this gives me a, a bit of a tactical opening here. I can play queen e4 maybe and try and uh, improve my situation on the queen side. Also, he needs to work out how not to lose one of his bishops here. Queen g5 probably accomplishes that. Also, he can take on c3 first and then play queen g5 check if I take to the pawn. Well played. And also, the, I, I was just about to play bishop, bishop f3, but that actually, uh, well, it doesn't actually lose a, a piece, but it it's still not a very good move. Although, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not that bad. It's a bit of a sad choice, though, because now he... <clears throat> Now he has has the option of liquidating into a very very equal endgame, but I think my position can't really tolerate much too much in a way of ambitious play right now. I first need to try and uh, not get steamrolled. No, I don't think my opponents are watching me. I think the stream is lagging a little bit, and I think uh, trying to play and watch the stream would be to, to their disadvantage actually. They could pause it and sort of rewatch it afterwards. But uh, watching it while the stream is live, I think, is uh, inadvisable. Hmm. I could try playing the dragon and explain why uh, why I don't like it. I actually quite like the opening. I just don't know enough to, to play it successfully. It's, a, it's an opening which punishes uh, imprecise play very, very severely. No, I'm not going to go f3, king f2. Uh, I think the grob will be my first and last foray into the, uh, you know, weird territory tonight. I don't think we should be going overboard with playing extremely strange openings. I would like to force him to play h... Ah, oh, actually, if he goes now. I was about to say, if he goes h5, I can play rook g5 and win his queen, but I can't actually. I have to switch to the defense for the for, for the time being, because rook c5 was a bit of an unpleasant threat. And also, I very much like this rook on the fourth. It, it does uh, a great deal of work for me. 
covers a lot of important squares, also creates threats in some cases. So I would like to preserve it as long as possible. Maybe a4 instead of king b2 was even more precise, uh, sort of. Uh, um, getting his rook stuck on a5, but uh, what I'm doing is also fine. Would very much like to start something on the queen side now by playing h5, if he can just take. Yeah, I'll we'll play rook g1, creating a threat of rook g5. I think I'm a, a, a good deal better here. Sorry, I'll need to mute the video. He should have been, I, I think it's time for him to start exchanging pieces. I think rook a6 is a bit too, is a bit too ambitious. He should have gone uh, queen e5 and tried to exchange queens. Whoa, <laughs> I, just I just blundered queen a3 check. That's, uh, yeah, I got lulled into a false sense of security there. Because uh, I was uh, so much of the, in control of the entire board that I, I forgot I could actually be threatened anywhere. Now I need to pay attention to what I'm doing. Because of my superior structure, I'm still not that much worse, I think. But uh, yeah, playing this game for a win, apart from on time, will now be difficult. I think I can take this. Of course, uh, if my opponent continues playing very, very sharply for a win, he will create winning chances for me here, which is what I think is happening right now. I could go for a king march up the board, but I don't think it achieves very much apart from, uh, well, aesthetic effects, so to speak. This is a good move. He needed to get this room behind the pawn as early as possible. But he should not exchange it under any circumstance. He should keep it alive. That's that's correct play. And now it's not quite clear if I can actually improve here. If one pair of rooks comes off, I'm I'm a great deal better, but I don't see how I can force this exchange. Yeah, let's offer a draw. I don't really feel like flagging. The position is now completely equal. Now, now that the the c6 pawn is exchanged for the a5 pawn, I'm I'm no longer better at all. So, uh, winning this just for the sake of winning doesn't really feel right. But uh, in this position, after well, more or less any sensible move like a2, a4, I think I'm a great deal better. Let's continue with the Dutch theme. I've played enough Grunfeld in my life, I think. It's very possible that I should not have allowed this. But let's try and work with what we've got here. Uh, as for my mindset with regards to flagging people, uh, I'm not at all certain my mindset is more correct, so to speak, than Jan's. As somebody pointed out to me uh, during the previous banter when I was, I, it didn't feel to me like I was whining, but maybe I was whining a little bit about people flagging me in completely lost positions. Uh, Blitz is and you know always has been about time management. And uh, if you end up with 20 seconds against a minute and a half, it's your fault and you don't really uh, have you know a leg to stand on in regards to you know complaining about uh, you know ethics or anything of that sort. So uh, I am not at all convinced uh, you know what I'm doing is right and what Jan is doing is wrong. I don't think there is any right and wrong in this debate if it's a debate. But uh, I always you know disliked flagging in completely in completely drawn positions. I generally even in my you know. Uh, in the 
years when I played uh, online Blitz actively in the, in the golden years of ICC when this site did not exist yet. Uh, you know, I always offered draws in, draws in those positions and uh, never really played for time in, in some kind of a, you know, three against three rook end game. So, you know, if I didn't do it then when I sort of cared about my rating and was, you know, trying to climb the ladder and do all these things, why, why should I do it now? Uh, in this game, I think I, I should have prevented him from getting uh, e2, e4 in so early. Uh, back to chess. But uh, I still got a playable position here. And I think uh, in playing King h1 and Rook g1, he severely underestimated how unpleasant knight e4 is in this position. Because now uh, knight takes f2 uh, is a threat of mate in one, and if he does this, uh, actually, rook g3 also loses a piece. So, um, in in two moves in a very playable position, he went from an unclear position to a completely lost one, which can happen in a in a sharp position, which requires a precise calculation. Once again, my not flagging people doesn't make me a, a, a any kind of human being, you know, great or otherwise. Hang on a second. I need to pay attention again. I assumed I will play rook f7, and then I probably still can, actually. I think this actually wins a piece, but I should have thought about it earlier, sort of before I played it, because it's a bit tricky. But, uh, you know, making any kind of conclusions about me as a human being based simply on the fact that I don't flag people in absolutely equal positions, I think, is overstating the case a great deal. It's just a habit by now. Uh, now I'm a rook up, and uh, once again, uh, as somebody pointed out in chat, resign seems strong. But even rook takes g7, even rook takes g7, king takes h6 wouldn't help him much because uh, there are no checks, and uh, I, I will be able to defend this position quite easily. Uh, but here, I think uh, he probably should have started by maybe taking on g6 or playing c takes d5 because he needs to start opening my position up a little bit so that I have things to worry about as well. Maybe knight e5 is a decent move, but king h1, rook g1 is just way too slow. Okay. People were demanding Karakan, but I don't think they meant this one. I think I should go sort of all out here and try and occupy as much space in the center as possible. It's hard to, yeah, King, actually King G2, I, I don't know, uh, it's another of my uh, quirks that I know about myself, actually. I I tend to first think about moves which, uh, you know, aren't directly, uh, directly concerned with protecting material. I'm looking for, you know, in a position where a lot of stuff is hanging, I... I am very, very drawn to moves which don't actually protect anything. Uh, if they're no good, I will consider moves which do protect stuff. But uh, my first instinct always is is to uh, sacrifice something, or if uh, somebody sacrifices something to me, my first instinct always is to try and find a way to return the sacrifice and regain initiative. So. Mm. This is, uh, I, I've known this about myself for a while, actually. And it's not always good. It's, uh, you, you know, I'm not particularly proud about this. In some positions, you do need to uh, be very, very materialistic.
Yeah, this is also a, a, an important statement. I'm not sure it's true, but uh, uh, it's 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 absolutely correct to say that you know I can afford being very generous with rating points on chess 24, but. Uh, I honestly don't know what I would have done if I had the same position in a, uh, well, I, that's actually not quite true. I guess, you know, if, if my, my match against Karekin went, uh, uh, you know, the distance and we played an Armageddon game, and in the final Armageddon game, I would get a Rukan game like this, and, uh, you know, a minute and a half against 20 seconds, it is very, very likely that I would have continued. Uh, considering the stakes, but that endgame wasn't very symmetrical. In a completely symmetrical three against three, I don't know. Now we got a very sharp position in which a lot depends on whether I will get d5, d6 in. If the pawn reaches d6, then uh, I will be much better. But yeah, uh, this move was worrying me a great deal. And actually, I think I will reply d6 anyway, because if I take on d3, I think my opponent was playing to play knight takes d5. And I think those tactics work out for him. And if they do, I will lose my, you know, my pride and joy, uh, the, the pass pawn on the d file. And I think this pass pawn is worth, in this position, it's worth much more than uh, an exchange. And playing the way I'm playing right now, uh, I will regain, regain some material back almost immediately, I think. This is a decent move, which I did not anticipate. I can win a piece back, but then I will lose my both the, the c5 and the d6 pawn, which is something I would very much like to avoid if I can find a way up. Yeah, I think I I barely want to play something like rook d1 here, but I need to evaluate it first because he can play knight d7, and I might end up losing those pawns anyway, and that would be um, somewhat pointless if I if I lost them if I lost them anyway without picking up any material that would be a bit stupid. Um, this I don't quite understand. I would like to I would like to know why. Uh, this is slightly surprising. If I take on f6 here, he can take on c5. I need to go king h1, he will take on f6, I take on f6, he takes on d6. And uh, this position is not even worse for black, I think. And despite the fact that I can pick up the, the e4 pawn, I mean, generally speaking, with the knight having no solid outposts in the center, uh, if anyone is playing for a win here, I suspect it's black, not white. Uh, if I go queen e3, as somebody suggested in chat, knight g4 more or less wins on the spot. So uh, this is completely impossible. Uh, when my opponent resigned, I was at that moment considering going knight b5. But after knight b5, once again, he can play something like knight g7 maybe. Bishop g7, king g7, c6, uh, knight e5. And maybe I'm good after c7, but... Uh, the game is very much on. People are suggesting bishop 6 and 95, but black takes on c5 first, as I just didn't demonstrate it. You're not paying attention. Pay attention, people. Uh, you are correct. If he takes on f6 immediately, 95 is possible, although even there, black has queen d4 check. But black can take on c5 intermediary. Uh, an intermediate move, sorry, and, uh, and only then take on f6. So that's uh, slightly surprising. Yeah, I think the, the suggestion that maybe his his dinner was ready is more to the point. Whoops. I'm not sure what I did there. Sorry. Yeah, me and scrolling are not the best of friends. No. Uh, hoping everything is back to normal. Okay, I played some open games. Let's maybe... 
switch to something else. Okay, and I changed my mind again. Why are you doing this to me? I know this exists. It, it even has been played by some half decent players, I think, but why, why are you doing this? There's really no reason for this. So we get some kind of a weird on off position with more or less an extra tempo for white, but on the other hand, black is one tempo closer to uh, controlling the d5 square, so maybe I should play against it by playing c5. Because uh, if we get some kind of an isolani, this knight on c7 is actually not that stupid. It will come to g5 and uh, be a very decent blockading piece. Which is why I think playing c5 here and uh, uh, sort of pointing out to my opponent that this knight is not, at least currently, not doing very much could be a decent idea here. Although I need to react to b6 somehow. Maybe I can play b4 anyway. If he goes a5, I can choose between taking on b6 and playing b5, or maybe even b5, uh, b5 straight away. I'm not sure. I quite like b5 straight away. I think it will lead to a very interesting position. Playing c6 instead of b4, yes, it was possible. It's not that easy for black to actually attack that pawn, but he can sort of play around it by playing e6, bishop d6, and trying to deal with it later, and I didn't want to do it so early. Although it was most certainly one of the candidates that was in this position. Uh, if the if the question is uh, uh, about ah, there's uh, I have uh, various uh, eagle quotes on on different social media. I think the one you mean uh, on my uh, chess twenty four profile page. Uh, uh, this one is from Kalivala. Uh, my son was reading Kalevala in the summer uh, because it was uh, uh, required reading, basically. And he, for, for some reason, he was told to read Kalevala uh, during the summer break. And uh, he was reading it in English and uh, reading out uh, favorite bits of it to me. And that one we, we liked quite a bit because it uh, it goes, I will misquote it now and will be very ashamed, but it goes, uh, he was not among the largest, right? Uh, nor was he among the smallest. And then there is an actual size description, which is he was touching the sea with one, with one wing and the sky with the other. So uh, a typical uh, Finnish understatement there. It was a reasonably large eagle. Knight takes c3, I just play queen c2 anyway. But a5 right now worries me a great deal. Or in this position, but I think on the previous move it was even stronger. Using the fact that uh, with my queen off the first rank, I cannot, uh, I cannot play a3. But now I think... I should be fine. Well, fine as in uh, hopefully quite a bit better. Unless b takes c5, d takes c5, a4 works. This move I am less worried about. Because he will not have enough pieces to actually attack the b5 pawn. Uh, so that I can start caring about it. You know, it's very tempting to even maybe just take on b6, but I will continue improving my pieces because there is no flurry. I covered the the, the, the wild card and uh, the one situation uh, very early on uh, in the broadcast. I'm not going to return to it. Uh, whether or not it was correct is a sort of a moot question. Uh, it was definitely one of the options and uh, 
it's now a done deal, so we can all start preparing for for the tournament. And I'm a huge fan of Livon as a chess player, so well, I have no real issues with it. This knight, I think, belongs on c3, not f3, but uh, it will take me a while to get it there. But let's do it anyway. Hmm. I, was, I was planning to play rook before next, but my opponent stopped me. Okay, I still need this knight on c3, so I will continue with the plan. I'm not sure I should have allowed e4, though. I somehow just sort of uh, went past this. Uh, it was a bit of a turning point, and I just went past it completely as if it wasn't an issue at all, and I think it was. I probably should have taken only five because with a, this huge passer on c6, I should have opened up uh, the position as much as possible. My plan is to bring the king uh, over to somewhere around b2 and then uh, play against the a4 pawn because for him, it will be quite hard to create any actual counterplay on the king side with so many pieces tied up on the queen side. I can maybe already start threatening stuff on the queen side here. I could have done this ages ago, I could have done this with the king on g1, but uh, I assumed he will realize what the threat was and play a3, and then I still probably knew the king on b3, so I started with the, queen, with the king march. I, I definitely have friends in the chess world. The closest one probably is, is Alexander Grishev, but he is not uh, the only one. Um, I'm actually recognizing a lot of these screen names now. So I will try playing somebody I haven't played before. Okay, that evening continues. Uh, since people seem to still be asking me questions about this, of course, had uh, Vladimir Kramnik uh, gotten the nomination instead of instead of Livon. Oops, sorry. That would also have, have been understandable and uh, uh, he would also be a, you know, a very, very welcome addition in a tournament like this. This is a very, very tricky line and I haven't returned to it in a while. And after this move, I think I'm supposed to have some kind of a force draw. Uh, I looked at this line in, in great detail for, for the hunter candidates, but I haven't played I haven't played much of it afterwards, and uh, I can't really recall all of the details straight away. I think I may have mixed up something here. But I think I should have gotten this. Although maybe it's not that bad. I think the main line actually goes knight takes e5, queen takes f2, king h1, and white is not worse there, but uh, neither is he better. I don't actually keep score or so to speak, of my score against various people uh, in regards to the question uh, who of uh, Kramnik and Aronian have a better score against. I know the answer uh, comparatively. I, I definitely have a better score against Livon than against Vlad. 
but I don't know the actual scores. This is a tricky position, so I will I will try to calculate for a second. Might be in a slight bit of trouble here. And also I should start playing faster. I mean, Levon obviously has a lot of supporters who would very much like to see him play a match against uh, against Magnus. And uh, as, as people have already pointed out in chat, Vlad has been world champion. Sorry about this. Continuing from last week where people were blundering pieces left and right. But... Uh, my guess is, you know, out of the people who didn't qualify outright, uh, those two names are the first uh, are the first ones on on uh, you know any any list of of uh, people would like to see as purely as spectators. I think uh, Aronian and Kamnik are the first two names on the list. I think Magnus is quite good at chess. That would be the the short version. Comparing the candidates' tournaments uh, is very, very difficult, but uh, it's actually, you know, the field is uh, remarkably similar to last year. I think we have five, sorry, uh, I think we have five people carried over from last year to this year, and we have uh, Nakamura, Karwana, and Giri instead of Andrekin, uh, Kramnik. And uh, I'm going slightly brain dead here. I think this one is a non-starter. Who am I missing? And uh, Mimijaro, of course. So I think uh, on paper and probably in you know in in actual fact as well, this candidate is. Uh, stronger than the previous one because even in 14 already people were sort of clamoring for hikaru and fabiano to uh get their chance to play in this tournament and danish has uh, has been you know very very uh, solid and successful at the very top level for a while now so I think, uh, yeah, I think people are kind of very well booked up after Queen E8. So I will try something I don't actually know. What am I supposed to do here? Not entirely certain. I'll try developing pieces. Operating under the premise that developing pieces and uh, getting stuff into play cannot be all that bad. No, I'm not playing London. Uh, if I uh, solve the visa issues and have enough free time, I might visit as a as a guest of the London Chess Classic this year, I would very much like that because I very much like London and the tournament. But uh, I can I I can I cannot guarantee this at all because uh, I still haven't got a visa, and uh, you know with the amount of traveling I have to do between now and London, I'm not at, I'm not at all certain I will be in time with the with the application, and uh, might simply not get the visa in time, which will be sad. London is one of my uh, most favorite places on earth, and I would very much like to visit even for a short while. Sort of very slowly, I think I got a, a very nice position here because uh, by playing bishop e6 when I did, I, I put him in a situation where he felt he was obliged to go c5, which probably he wasn't, but it was 
already slightly uncomfortable for him. And now I have this fantastic outpost for the knight on d5, which uh, uh, it, it's a tremendous piece. Uh, sort of watching over the entire board, and also his bishop on b2 is uh, not a very happy, happy piece right now. And here I feel incredibly tempted to go for some kind of mate. I really want to play knight f4 here, but I don't think it works. I mean, uh, yeah, I have this is a five minute game, so I can actually try and calculate this. Um, hang on a second. It's an incredibly unattractive idea, but I don't think it works. I can, I can try and aim for a perpetual, but uh, first of all, I don't want a perpetual. I think I'm slightly better. But secondly, I don't even get a perpetual. I will show you what I mean after the game. But I don't like the idea of exchanging this knight. It's such a proud knight. This is all very regrettable. Let's do something slightly strange. I'm trying to, uh, if I if if I will be able to uh, keep this rook on f3, and if I if I don't allow him to exchange it, the plan with h5 h4 is actually surprisingly dangerous, and this I don't think works for him because rook fd1 I can ah I forgot about rook c3. This is quite well played by my opponent actually. Yeah, I thought this wasn't working because rook fd1 is impossible and rook d2. Uh, sort of, he no longer wants to exchange my rook. But this works out fine for him. What does it? I have a tricky option here, which I want to explore. Yeah, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. I think I win a pawn by doing this. It's just a pawn, and probably the, the resulting rook endgame was very close to equal, but... Uh, I felt it was the best move in the position. And now I need to try and occupy some open files. He can attack the g5 pawn twice and probably win it. But I will, in that time, I will bring my king closer to the center. And uh, I think I might be slightly better here, but not very much. I do have a passer which he will have to pay attention to. And his king is uh, generally in rook ending. If my king is centralized and his king is still on g1, I should retain some pressure. But uh, it's not a lot of pressure, obviously. Yeah, and king d6 was probably a waste of a tempo. I should have gone uh, either rook c4 immediately or maybe king e5. This wasn't particularly well played by me. I still maybe have a little something, something here, but uh, objectively this should be a draw. By exchanging, exchanging these pawns, I'm hoping to bring my pawn over to a4, and uh, and then his pawn on a3 will be slightly weak. But once again, you know, we're talking about, you know, minuscule potential advantages, and his plan of acting, activating his king is actually more relevant to the position than what I'm doing. Which is why I'm driving it back. I think king takes a... Yeah, but this yeah, this is also a draw, of course. Just king g5 and uh, push the h pawn. He might even pretend he's slightly better, but I don't think he is. I think it's uh, very equal. Although I should I forgot about rook h3 completely. I should have put my rook behind. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here, to be honest. This, uh, this is very, very cooperative of me. I completely forgot about rook h3. Now I'm actually in a great deal of trouble. 
potentially. Although I should probably save this game. Yeah, this probably should be a draw now. Maybe I can even play for a win. Can I? If I take on a3 next move, it's, an, it's a clear draw because his king is way too far away for him to do much about it. Yeah, and this is a good move. But uh, I'm trying to calculate. Isn't this... This is maybe winning for me, no? Did I miscalculate the tempi? Or maybe not... Yeah, not winning. It's still a draw, but I mean... I am the first one to the pawn. Yeah, sorry. Uh, saying it was winning would be was slightly ridiculous, but uh, I was kind of worried. I, I, I miscalculated so badly that he was the first one to b5, which was always always going to be very unlikely. I'm not sure why. Yeah, okay, now it disappeared. Any requests uh, against 1e4? Okay. Uh, people wanted the Karakan. Let's play a proper Karakan. Uh, my favorite chess books. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I have uh, great memories uh, from. You know, from from the books I've read as a child, uh, you know all the the classics that a you know a Soviet uh, a Soviet child who started playing chess in those years. You know, you will you will get a standard list. You know, Zurich fifty three, uh, my system, which I still think is a good book and uh, uh, a fantastic book about the interzonal uh, seventy nine in Riga. From yeah, I'm not uh, mistaken about the dates. Montreal 79 was a fantastic tournament book. But uh, there has been a great deal of very, very good chess literature put out recently. Starting with, uh, I don't know, my great, my great predecessors, for instance. We, if, we, if we're not even touching on a uh, tremendous wealth of uh, opening information being published right now, I mean, the the Avrov books, uh, the, the other stuff. I mean, but the Avrov books come to mind first. There's a, I think uh, we, we live in a golden age of chess literature. Uh, so, I haven't seen any E5 requests. Uh, sorry. There were people requesting E5. I always play E5. Oh, no, actually, I'd never play E5. Sorry. Sorry about all this. My position now is quite comfortable, but actually not as good as I initially thought it was. And uh, not taking on d4 in the previous move was a tremendously bad choice. I'm actually slightly ashamed I didn't do that. But I still have a very typical small combination, which I will show you in a second, which should give me a decent advantage. Assuming he goes knight c3, he probably actually should go king e2. Because after knight c3, I have this. This is a very, very uh, typical uh, small combination, uh, which you can see in a lot of French and uh, Karakam positions, which opens up the center very efficiently and gives black, uh, in particular in a situation like this, you know, gives black a great deal of advantage. Which is why... You know, ugly as it looked, king e2 was probably a better choice there. I've read some of Marin's uh, English books, and they are excellent. If you want to learn the English, I think uh, reading Marin will be a, a very, very good starting point for everyone or anyone. And... Uh, 
even for uh, very good players, I think uh, those books are extremely useful. I know that uh, Alexander Grisha created them very, very greatly and actually based his uh, English, English repertoire. At some point, he started playing the English very seriously. And uh, I know that uh, he used uh, the Marin books as a starting point for most of his choices there. He, of course, expanded on them greatly in many positions, but he started off by, by reading Marin. Um, let's be greedy and win another pawn. But basically, even if I do nothing here, my structure is just so superior that uh, with one extra pawn, I would have won easily enough. But uh, it's really no reason not to win a second one. And now we can capture this rook. But, uh, of course, uh, giving him the option of playing c3 was just absolutely ridiculous. Had I taken on d4 straight away and played bishop c5, I would have had a great deal of advantage here. Instead, I played this, and if he goes king e2 here, it's actually very, very hard for me to uh, attack his central uh, uh, central pawns. And if he, if he gets f4 in the next move, Yes, he will have a very, very uh, rigid pawn structure, which uh, you know has no pawn breaks to look forward to, and you know have a very comfortable position. But uh, um, it, it would be very, very difficult for me to make any significant progress, at least uh, straight away. Okay, back to e4, I think. Let's uh, try for some more face damage. People have been discussing uh, Boris Gelfand in chat. Boris is uh, one of the most, you know, interesting and uh, deep chess players of the past couple of decades. He's a tremendous player. Uh, <clears throat> whether he can make a come there was a question on whether he can make another come comeback he hasn't actually gone anywhere so to speak you know he has been a modern great for a very very long time and continues to be one so uh i'm not sure what comeback is being referred to there but uh uh if uh the question was about whether he can fight for the world championship again. It's incredibly difficult with the way uh, the cycle is structured right now. It, it, it always has been difficult, but uh, in particular right now, when you, I mean, you, you, you either need to do uh, very, very well in a World Cup or, uh, or do very well in the Grand Prix, and both of those are incredibly uh, difficult tournaments to play in with only two spots available from them. So all of us are, you know, I would like to think that uh, more or less anybody is the underdog to qualify. You know, there is a great deal of very strong players right now in the world and uh, uh, very few qualification places available. In this game, I think knight c6 is not the most precise reply after five bishop d3, and I should be much better here. I should actually try and play as concretely as possible. Try and uh, uh, create as many problems as possible for him before he finishes development. And in this respect, I think, yeah, I forgot about bishop before check. I should have started by castling because this gives him an important tempo and now I probably need to give him uh, an opportunity to trade some pieces. Uh, there's a question of who I rate the highest among the uh, current under 25s. My problem with this question is I'm not entirely sure uh, what age all these people are, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, they're all way too young 
to my taste, you know, and uh, I get mixed up basically, but uh, I mean, the current crop is incredibly, incredibly strong. If you, if you consider, let's say, Fabiano, Hikaru, Anish, you know, the people, the people who just got into the, the, the candidates, they're all very, very good. And uh, Wei Yi is a promise, uh, you know, obviously a, a very exciting new prospect. Although, you know, my view on Wei Yi, I think I'm I'm getting this question in all, almost every single banter, and uh, you probably know by now what I think about Wei Yi. So I'm not going to repeat myself uh, yet again. But uh, there is a great deal of very promising youngsters. I won the Russian Championship seven times, and I think, yeah, I mean, the, the Russian Championship, I definitely hold the record because they've only been held since, you know, Russia existed as a as a state. If you include the, the Soviet Championships, I think uh, I'm joined first with uh, Botvinnik. At least this is what people tell me. I, I don't actually look these things up, but whenever I'm lucky enough to win, a Russian championship, somebody tells me that I'm now equal with uh, Batvinik or Petrosian or somebody, and this is how I know. He wants to go 94 next move. I would very much like to play B3. Oh, hang on a second, I can win more material. You know, positional considerations are all good and well, but if you can win more material, you should win more material. I'm not quite sure I understand this last question about the time machine. If I had the time machine and forgot all, all of my analysis, I would still probably use the time machine for something non-chess related. And uh, I, I'd probably be very interested in what the future looks like more than the past. So I don't think, uh, you know, chess theory features very highly on the list of things I would consider if I suddenly had a time machine. Not sure. I think I played most of these people before. So we've been going for an hour and a half, so um, let's make it three or four more, depending on, uh, I'm playing exclusively the Dutch today, so I'll continue playing the Dutch. Let's make it three or four more today, depending on how they go and whether they are five minutes or three minute games. Who is my main rival in the candidates? This is an interesting question, considered, considering the fact that I think uh, I'm nobody's favorite to win the thing. Uh, so I think the correct answer is all seven of the participants were not me. B4, I think, is what Shakri Armamidarov played against me in Hanty. This is not a particularly good move. You should not give Black a chance to play E5 for free, so to speak, in the Dutch. I think uh, this is giving Black way too much freedom. Paul Karras was, a, was obviously a, a great chess player. Uh, there was a question about Russian youngsters. The first name that comes to mind is uh, Artemiev who is uh, properly young, so to speak. He is very, very young. I think he's 17 right now. And already incredibly good. He won the, the higher league in, in uh, 2014, qualifying for the super final. And he's uh, done quite well in the super final. He finished poorly and uh, was not eventually in the running for the medals. But at some point, he was actually leading the tournament, I believe. So I think Artemiev is uh, a very, very promising player. 
of the people who are slightly older. Uh, there is a, a, a great deal of name. Well, at least you know a number of names I could I could mention. Uh, Dubov is a uh, uh, Daniel Dubov is obviously a very strong player, and uh, uh, Vladimir Fedosev, who I play, we play for the same club, so I've seen him sort of at close quarters. I think has great potential, and uh, we we seem to be doing okay on the talent front right now. And suddenly I'm a rook up in this game, but I still, you know, I should wrap it up convincingly, I think. What do I think about the Boris Ivanov scandal? Well, I think it's a scandal. And, uh, well, I have no data uh, apart from what everybody else knows. But it seems to me that it's incredibly likely that he did use uh, some sort of assistance. And uh, the fact that it's been going on for such a long time is very, very regrettable. But once again, uh, I take my information from public sources. I have no inside, inside information on this at all. I honestly don't know. I should try and give some kind of mate here. I think it's time. Alexander Marazevich is uh, one of the brightest and uh, most interesting chess players of the past 20 years. I'm you know, very much on record saying this. This doesn't help. Uh, but... Uh, he hasn't been playing at his best for, 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 for a while now. I think there are objective reasons for that, but uh, even if I can guess sort of at what they are, I don't think I should be uh, saying much on that subject. But uh, I mean, there were things you can find sort of some information on that subject in the public domain, but basically, uh, he's not always been uh, in the best condition to, to, to even play chess uh, in the past years, uh, very sadly. Because uh, when he plays uh, his best chess, he's a uh, joy to watch. I don't know why I allowed all this. Because I actually need to know something here, or I will get mated. Somebody should remind me what I'm supposed to play after he goes h f f5. I'm trying to... I used to know something about this position, but I can't really... Remember, and um, I think it will, and I will end up making some suboptimal moves here. What do I think about Caruana's chances against Caruana? I think Caruana will win. I would like to try to castle inside actually here. I don't feel particularly safe constantly inside in this position. So, But this is a sort of fraught with danger as well, because if I play bishop b7, f5 becomes f5 becomes very, very attractive potentially for him, but I still want to try and do this. Or at least distract him enough so that he starts playing on the queen side, and then I can uh, fool him by suddenly casting castling king side. Um, Rublevsky is somebody I played a, a tremendous amount of chess against. My first game against Rublevsky was when I was, I believe, nine and he was 10. So we've been playing each other for for a while now. And uh, 
he used to be a very very strong player i think severely under underrated in the west but now uh, you know he coaches the the russian women's women's team and uh, uh that's uh, that occupies most of his time and energy i have some ideas for for new video series but uh in what in which order they will uh, eventually be realized is very hard to say because uh most of my plans uh, in regards to uh, recording new videos were uh, sort of put on hold by me qualifying for the, for the candidates, uh, which, which I think you will understand. I need to prioritize this now. I don't know why I played d5. This is not a good move. Not because he can take on d5 and then take on b7 in the end, but uh, but because yeah, after the bishop uh, goes somewhere, I now have to deal with the fact that e4, e5 will lock down the position and uh, keep my g7 bishop completely out of play. Yeah, I don't know why I played d5. This was not a good choice. I don't think bullet will ever be uh, a world championship. I think uh, that's a bit too fast. I think uh, three plus two is still, you know, very much, very much chess. And uh, a world championship uh, held at three plus two blitz, I perfectly understand and quite like, and I participated with, in it this year, you know, and uh, enjoyed it a great deal. This is a, you know, a very typical combination, which I should actually discuss before I address the the blitz. This is, you see it in a lot of structures. In the closed Sicilian, there are positions where white does this. And uh, it's very tricky to deal with. Although in this particular position, I can actually, I think, take on f3. And if he takes on g7, I have a lot of, you know, discovered checks and everything. The reason I, why I didn't do it immediately is that he can take rook takes f3 here. But uh, I, I can still play knight d4 there, fg7, king g7, and I think I'm doing fine. In general, I think the you know the, the the trend towards the shortening of the time control is unavoidable, and it will continue. And uh, we have all, I think, made peace with this. But uh, world championship of bullet play, I think, would be overdoing it. I think that would be too much, actually. There would be, you know, no, too much of, you know, pieces flying around. And uh, 3 plus 2 is, you know, plenty exciting for for the spectators and, uh, and the live audiences and uh, there is no real reason to go any faster than this. I don't think I'm get, getting mated here. He can play bishop queen h4 here, but I think knight f5 works as a reply quite decently. And I can, I can also even play g5, which is a greedier move, but I think it works as well. And if he takes on h6, he only gives two checks. So I think I'm actually close to winning here, because if he does nothing, then, uh, well, I'm two pawns up, and I also will start. Uh, uh, pushing my own uh, initiative on the king's side. And my, you know, uh, I try to limit my cricket commentary to the minimum in these streams, but yeah, I, I greatly prefer test cricket to, to T20. I watch some T20 when there is, you know, a major international tournament going on, but uh, tests when I have free time, I watch sort of from beginning to end. And uh, to me, there's absolutely no comparison. I, I would. I would much rather watch tests than T20. Uh, 
Uh, why cricket and not baseball? It's basically to do with the fact that I was introduced to cricket way before I was introduced to, to baseball. I, I quite like baseball, but I don't understand the game nearly enough to, to appreciate it to the fullest. And also the time difference is uh, completely impossible for Russians. Pavel Lyanov, yeah, uh, Pavel Lyanov had a fantastic World Cup and uh, came within uh, one game to qualifying for the candidates. And uh, I mean, he's a great player. And uh, why would I whine if I played Stockfish? He's a great player, and uh, it's nice uh, to see him uh, getting uh, some recognition. Also, I don't know why I played G5. I always, my entire life, I played exclusively D6 and H6 lines against. That's actually a lie. I played some of this as well against Fyodorov in his prime. No, I never actually played any programs. I don't really see the point in that. We sort of all, all know the result. And I, I don't quite see uh, why I should be, you know, subjecting myself to to this. I'm not sure about Bishop D2, though. And generally speaking, I think uh, he should have castled before take, taking on F4, because now, as you can see, his position deteriorated quite, deteriorated quite sharply. It's still playable, but... I have a feeling he may have even been better had he gone uh, had he gone castles after my after me castling. But now I I should be quite a bit better here. Uh, I'm very very confused by the suggestion that a, that a machine can actually give rook odds to a grandmaster. I think you are uh, overstating the case a great deal there. I don't think any, I mean, in a, I don't know, two minute blitz game, uh, maybe it would flag you occasionally, but even that I think is unlikely. Hang on a second, it's a three minute game, so I should probably concentrate slightly on the moves I'm making because it's a nice position, I don't want to spoil it. But maybe the way not to spoil it is not to hurry at all, just come back to e8. The king on f1 is horrible, and also his his dark squares are very, very weak. And uh, yes, he, need, he needs to play queen d4, but yeah, I. I just don't like the idea of exchanging queens here, even though it gives me a great deal of advantage. But I think I have to, sadly. He has to play knight b5 now, after which once again I will have a choice because I can take on b5 and on b2 and play an end game, which is, I guess, maybe even technically winning, but it will take a while. I can play c6 and uh, aim for more. If he doesn't change pieces here, I think he will end up regretting it even more. Because uh, it will be very, very hard for him to connect his pieces here. I think he will, he will end up losing more material by doing this. And now, uh, as you can see, three moves later, he just lost this knight for nothing because I go rook one check and take on h1. I still haven't seen the pawn sacrifice because uh, it was shown during the opening in Berlin, but uh, I was still uh, slightly traumatized after Baku and I ended up skipping it because I felt, uh, you know, not quite himself that evening, which is regrettable, but I will eventually see it. I, it's, it's an interesting experience. Although I think, uh, Objectively speaking, professional chess players are not the target audience because uh, 
uh, we know too much about the much. And uh, whenever some details are not quite right, you know, we will feel that, you know, more attention could have been paid to it and so on and so forth. I think this is still theory, and I think after e4 I can play g5, but I'm not 100% sure about this, but let's try it, I mean, at least it's fun to play. And if he takes on f3, there's a number of things I could have tried there. In this position, my plan was to go knight d4, but once again, I'm not sure I'm doing this perfectly. I think maybe there were stronger options available to white along the way. No, I think, uh, you know, as a movie, basically, yeah, my screen says I've disconnected and I have 25 seconds until loss, which is not promising, but now this warning has disappeared. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, it seems like I had a, a momentary break in the internet connection, but uh, seem to be back. Not quite sure. Hopefully I am, but I can't really say for certain. Tell me if we're live or not, because I'm I'm kind of curious. I don't really understand. My, my screen at some point started, every single application I'm using right now started telling me I lost internet, uh, which was worrying. But it seems to be back now, but I, I can't really judge from, from where I'm sitting. Yeah, I, knew, I, I know it went down, but is it still down? Uh, sorry about this. I I know we're not streaming, but uh, the machine seems to sus seem to be saying that I'm still recording. So I'll finish this game because uh, it would be sort of rude not to finish it. And then I'll uh, reboot the stream and see if this uh, helps things. Uh, there were interesting things to discuss in the opening of this game, but uh, I was so preoccupied with. Uh, the stream going down that we missed uh, this opportunity for which I, I apologize, but uh, technical issues are seemingly completely unavoidable these days whenever I try to stream, which is of course not ideal, but uh, sort of beyond my control. I'm slightly better in the same game, but only very, very slightly, I think. But this, I think, is optimistic, because generally speaking, you should not be uh, transposing into a rook endgame where your rook is so passive and uh, your opponent's rook is so active. It's incredibly difficult for my opponent to move now. And I have all kinds of active plans which he can 
uh, only deal with with great difficulty. For instance, I can do this and activate my king, and uh, I think now I'm, I'm probably even objectively winning. Uh, not to mention the fact that I'm, I'm clearly winning on time. Okay, I'll I'll stop this. Uh, let's see if we can play um, two or three more games before I discover I'm completely out of breath and can't calculate. And let's start it off by playing somebody who will probably crush me senseless, senseless if he's still at the machine and uh, will actually show up for the game, so to speak. Ah, oh, there we go. Hang on a second. This is something I've done in very serious game, I, games. I think I've done it once against Boris Gelfand and once against Vasily Ivanchuk. <clears throat> it looks weird, but there is a half-decent positional plan behind it, although I'm not sure Black actually has enough time for this. Ivanchuk replied by a very interesting strategic idea. He went uh, knight e5 here, and if Black goes uh, knight g4, knight g7, knight g3, and knight takes b2 was his follow-up. And knight c3, I think, is what uh, Gelfand played against me the first time I tried this in. I think it was Bill 90, no, 2000 something. I, I forget the dates for these things now. My plan is to play knight c6, b6, uh, and bishop b7. I probably need to include uh, rook b8 so that a b6 doesn't run into knight e5. But if I do, if I do manage uh, to get all these moves in, then I think my structure is incredibly healthy and I'm doing quite well. Not sure what knight b5 is all about, though. This seems a bit random to me. I'm somewhat confused by what my opponent is doing. But if he wants to trade the dark squared bishops, we can trade the dark squared bishops. I have no real objections. Structurally, my position, of course, is fantastic, but uh, I still need to pay attention so that I don't blunder any forks. Hang on a second. Time for old-fashioned greed, I think. I think it's time for old-fashioned greed. Although I might actually get mated by doing this. I don't see how. If I don't get mated, I just want a piece for not very much, but I still need to pay attention, of course. For instance, taking with a rook and allowing rook e4 would have been a mistake. But I can do this instead. The king feels quite safe on f8, and as long as I don't allow him any activization of his rooks, I should just be a piece up. I think I can take this. Still a whole piece up, but I, of course, you know, some some attention is always needed in a position like this because it's very easy to blunder something. But the king on a fate is, uh, you know, very very safe, and uh, he 
he doesn't even have too many checks I need to worry about. So I, you know, I will try now to uh, bring out some of those pieces which aren't doing very much currently. If I can activate this knight, I think it will be easier for me to convert my advantage. Although it also uh, gives him potential checks, so I should be careful here. Yeah, once the e5 pawn is gone, I am, of course, completely winning. This was slightly inaccurate because he can now pick up the b6 pawn, but uh, even that is completely winning, so it doesn't really matter what I do here. He feels he will be much faster than I am, but I don't think I will, I'm, I'm that slow uh, a, whole, a whole piece up. Uh, hang on a second. I'll just... Uh, uh, ask the chat directly because I'm I'm not sure how, how lagging the video is. Okay. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, interesting and... Uh, generally... Uh, I think what... What uh, Ivanchuk did against me by playing knight e5 is very interesting because this move aims to completely stop me from going knight c6. And uh, eventually I rejected playing something natural like knight fd7, knight d3, and bishop b2, knight b2 because I felt it gives white uh, a very comfortable game. And I went for something uh, convoluted like queen c7 followed by rook fg8. And uh, I had a very, very uh, suspect position out of the opening, although I eventually won that game. Okay, uh, two more, I think, and we'll wrap it up for today. One f4 is a perfectly playable, uh, perfectly playable move. I don't think it's the best move in the position, but of course you can play the Dutch with an extra tempo. I mean, the Dutch in itself is uh, a playable opening if you know theory well enough. So uh, playing it, uh, playing it with uh, with an additional tempo is of course perfectly fine. More questions about Wei Yi. He seems to have a tremendous fan following for somebody who has just appeared on the scene. This actually transposed to a position which was popularized by a number of different people. But uh, I've looked at it at some point, so I actually have some idea as to what Black is supposed to be doing here. Uh, the most famous chess quote about the Dutch, I think, belongs to Tigran Vartanovich Petrosian, who at some point uh, somebody asked him for whatever reason, uh, there was probably some context, but he was asked what he thinks about the Dutch, and he said, uh, please, by all means, let them uh, continue playing the Dutch against him. Against me, uh, uh, I built my summer house on the money I won playing against people who play the Dutch. So uh, I, I'm fully aware that not everybody is is a fan of the opening. But if you if you put in enough work uh, into uh, understanding it and mastering it, I think it's playable. Um, once again, of course, there are openings which are infinitely more solid and uh, more, you know, quote-unquote correct, but uh, uh, I think the moral of, uh, you know, most of these discussions is if you, put in, if you put in enough work, you can play anything. And this has been proven, uh, you know, time and again by people who are willing to uh, put in enough work. Uh, there's, you know, plenty of examples you can name. Would very much like to visit St. Louis. Uh, you, there were some 
talks about this for a number of years, but it never really materialized. But uh, I would very much like to to eventually make my way there and have a look because it seems like you know a, a place where a lot of very good things, uh, you know, chess related things are happening right now. I think I can take on a three here and win a queen, so I should do that. Yeah, he said Dacia, but I wasn't. <clears throat> I wasn't sure I should be using that because I don't think everybody and uh, every single person understands that word. It is Dutch. Lots of very, very knowledgeable people out there today. Sort of totally winning here we kind of glanced uh, uh, sort of, uh, this game went a bit too fast for me to say much but uh, um, my opponent's reaction to uh, the movie 75 which I think maybe even was a novelty when I thought about it first which was some time ago but has since been played in a number of high level games I think my opponent's reaction to that move was not ideal, and uh, I was more or less winning from that moment on. Uh, there is a question in chat whether I'm still excited to, uh, you know, feeling, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a grandmaster, and doesn't doesn't this uh, give me a feeling of excitement? Uh, I think it, it. I was kind of hoping that uh, my my feeling of uh, you know love for chess comes across in the shows because uh, you know it would be incredibly difficult to be doing this if I felt indifferent about the game. More or less impossible, I would think. So uh, of course you, uh, I still love the game a, a great deal. Mm, you know. Uh, it's not always easy for me to force myself to work on chess seriously, when especially when I'm at home, because, uh, well, because uh, that always has been a problem and continues to be a, being a problem. But playing chess is still uh, still you know highly enjoyable, and I you know that's you know a major reason as to why I'm still doing it because once once it stopped. It stops being uh, enjoyable. I think uh, simply even the results I think will go down drastically once you stop enjoying the game. Okay, last one tonight. And there is a question I absolutely must address there. But first, let me start the game, and we should be a five-minute game against somebody decent, I think, so that I have a chance to speak. But also. Um, There was a question about the uh, the recent series between uh, England and Pakistan in the uh, in the Emirates, which England lost. And uh, yes, the result is disappointing, but uh, I think uh, you know compared to what went on before, uh, you know, the last time England played Pakistan there, this series uh, showed some encouraging sights for the development of the team there are some very decent young players coming through i think and uh you know in terms of results uh, uh it's a pity you know the light wasn't good enough for uh, for us to, to, to win the first test and uh, uh, the losses in the next two were you know on some level avoidable but uh, once again you know compared to the previous series there's no uh, no sense of despair i don't play cricket at all because uh first of all i'm i'm old and constantly injured and uh secondly there is really no place to play cricket in russia so Yes, I'm following India versus South Africa. Of course, I'm following India versus South Africa. I follow, I mean, Crick Info is one of the pages I open uh, every morning of every day. 
Anyway, this is a line I played a lot with black, so I know a little bit about it with white. And King B1 is is currently, I think, one of the uh, most promising tries for white. Uh, I lost a reasonably famous game uh, in this line against Fabiano Caruana in Stavanger in 2014, where we both went for the same very, very forcing position. And uh, his analysis turned out to be more detailed and more precise than mine, and I wasn't able to find uh, to find the solution over the board. There was a solution which would have allowed me to save the game, but I couldn't find it over the board because really in positions like this, you should know the solution. You shouldn't be looking for it whilst playing. I'm not sure about this move, but I wasn't sure about any other move either, so I thought I'll do this. It uh, transforms some advantages I have right now into different sets of advantages because I will I will end up having two bishops against the bishop in the knight, and uh, my opponent will have some targets on the king side I can play against. But on the other hand, I'm exchanging the e5 pawn for the g7 pawn, and the e5 pawn was very very important. It was very very important because it it allowed me you know the outpost and. For instance, he couldn't really probably have castled on the previous move because knight of six check was very strong. Saying that Olga banned me from sports is a bit strong, but she uh, uh, appealed to all of my friends and colleagues uh, uh, to never invite me to play football again. It's mainly football. Most of my injuries come from football. Because you should be playing it more often than once every two years. There are insects trying to do unspeakable things to me, which explains all the hand waving. Apologies for that. He wants to go knight f5, which is something I would like to prevent, but uh, how? Basically, in a position like this, if the queens come off, I would probably take black, actually. I think black would be very, very comfortable if the queens came off. So what I'm trying to do is to preserve queens on the board so that I have at least potential play against his uh, uh, weakened king on the eight. And now I want to put this bishop on b2 so that I don't have to worry about it anymore. I will still play bishop b2, although it looks like a bit of a waste of time, but yeah, now I need to uh, pay attention to what I'm doing. And also knight of four is, he's headed towards d5 and c3, which is something I should have worried about slightly earlier. I could have probably stopped it. That wasn't ideally played by me, but I can still take on c3. It's not a huge deal because uh, he doesn't really have uh, the pieces to exploit uh, the potential weakness of my king side. And as you can see, now that I finally, yeah, this is a good move. Once again, I will look for something else because I really, really don't want an endgame here. I, I need to keep the queens on board. Rook e2 runs into rook takes g3 is out. Though so, um, my options is actually are, are actually kind of limited. It's very unfortunate the way I set up my pieces that I can't I can't really avoid making a very awkward move like Queen E2. But I would have played H4 in his spot on the previous move instead of Rook G5. I think uh, it made a lot of sense for him to. Uh, keep my pawns on the light squares where they would be attacked by the rook on g8 and the bishop on g7. Yeah, I'm planning to get myself into, uh, let's put it like a slightly better shape that I am in right now for for the candidates. I don't know what will, uh, you know, whether this will work out for me or not, but that's the plan. The amount of time I need, I had to waste uh, avoiding the queen's exchange. I now have to pay a great deal of, ten of attention to what he's doing on the queen's side. So probably I will end up exchanging the queens anyway. 
This is not ideal. Can I try and avoid it? I mean, something like queen b6 is, you know, very, very... Uh, no, not very, very, but it's... It's interesting to contemplate, but I don't think it's very good. Yeah, I think I need to do this. This is a very sad day. Not only do I have to exchange uh, the queens, but he also has rook d2 now, which is, you know, particularly unpleasant. Because it forces me to exchange, you know, even more pieces. And he should definitely trade bishops now. d5 would be a mistake, I think, because it would leave him with a with a worse bishop. Although now uh, I have some targets to potentially play against. I should have started with a3. I actually planned to start with a3. I don't know why I hadn't. That was a reasonably large mistake, actually. Uh, a bit of a sort of a brain misclick because I was planning to do it. And then I didn't. And this is very, very risky. I'm not sure if it works here. But he should have gone d5. I mean, not going d5 is a bit strange. Of course, uh, you need to uh, make it as difficult for me as possible to recapture this c pawn. This is a. Ah. Uh, I can't actually create a pass pawn on the king side here, so I may have I may have committed a bit of a faux pas here. This pawn ending might actually be objectively lost for me, which is kind of regrettable. Which is why I'm now trying to avoid it, but yeah, that's not the way to avoid it. I should have gone rook e3. Yeah, allowing e4 is a uh, I'm now in a very, very great deal of trouble. Probably even objectively lost. Yeah, this should be objectively lost now. And it all started with me not making a move I absolutely plan to make, which is uh, what I do every now and then for no reason that I can see. Yeah, this is completely lost now. Well played by my opponent, but I told myself that I need to play in this position. What I wanted to do was to play a3, follow it up by king b2, and then uh, think about what my next move on the queen side is. And instead of this, I went king b2 immediately, allowing b4, and uh, you know, creating this situation where both of my queen side and my king side is potentially dead. Because once what I was talking about uh, during the game, he could actually maybe even taken on c3 and and gone f5 here. And uh, because my uh, king side is ruined and I can't actually ever create a pass pawn on the king side, you can play king c6 followed by, uh, you know, e5 before creating a, uh, creating a passer in the center. And uh, it's very, very possible I'm lost here. But what he did is also fine. Um, so I think... Uh, you know, it's uh, first critical position in this game is is this one. I'm not sure if I actually need to play knight d6 check, but I was kind of confused because I can't play bishop d3 here because it allows knight b4, I think, and I don't really want to allow allow the uh, the trade of this knight for the d3 bishop. I think it favors black, and uh, stopping knight b4 and pretend pre 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 preparing bishop d3 by something like a3 also gives black a target to play against on the queen side. Uh, so this also did not appeal, but I could sort of pass by playing something like h4, which was probably a very decent move in this position, just gaining space on the king side, playing h5 next move if I'm allowed to, and basically just making a move which will be useful in most positions and waiting until black decides on something. But the second critical thing was after queen e1 h5, I should have been uh, much more concrete here. For instance, if I want to play b3, bishop b2, I probably should start doing it immediately. I should play b3 followed by bishop b2 next move and uh, 
this would uh, give me potentially an important tempo for further down the line. But from a certain point on, I think I was uh, just simply outplayed by my opponent who played uh, the resulting endgame better than I did. So congratulations to him. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was my first loss in the stream, which is a very, very decent result by my standards. I normally lose a, a number of games during, uh, during one session. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I will tomorrow leave for Moscow, where there will be a short training camp, uh, and then we all go to Reykjavik and play the European teams, uh, hoping to do better than we did last time. And uh, then I will come back home and uh, probably do uh, some more of this whilst hopefully preparing for, for the candidates. I think uh, Reykjavik will most likely be my last series tournament before the candidates. I will play some uh, rapid events, but uh, most likely nothing classical. Once again, thanks, thanks for watching. This has been uh, Peter Svidler for Chess24.